Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network, Grung. I'm Aspet Bedrosyan, and along with Hovik Manucharyan, we'll be talking about the demands of the political opposition in Armenia for a provisional government to lead the country out of the current crisis following the catastrophic loss in the war in Artsakh. This episode was recorded on Thursday, December 17, 2020. Following the trilateral Karabakh ceasefire on November 9, the Armenian opposition has nearly universally condemned Nikol Pashinyan's agreement to the deal. The largest opposition grouping, called the Movement of the Salvation of the Homeland, or Hayriniki Perkutsan Sharjum in Armenian, composed of 17 political parties, including the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, Prosperous Armenia, the Republican Party, are demanding Pashinyan's immediate resignation and the appointment of their unified candidate, Vazgen Manukyan, as interim PM. This group has been holding regular protests, featuring a growing number of participants, with the latest gathering Wednesday, December 17th, estimated to be 20,000 in size. Today, we'll be talking with a representative of one of the political forces of the movement to better understand the internal political developments in Armenia, and specifically the goals of the movement of the salvation of the homeland. To talk about these issues, we are joined by Artur Khachatyan, who is a member of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, ARF Darshnak Tutsun, Supreme Council in Yerevan. In the past, he held government posts such as Deputy Minister of Territorial Administration and Development, Governor of Shirak, and Minister of Agriculture. Currently, Arthur is Professor of Finance at the French University of Armenia and lectures on leadership at the Public Administration Academy of the Republic of Armenia. Hello and welcome, Arthur. Hi. Arthur, so to start off, can you describe what made the ARF Dashnak soon join forces with the 16 other political parties and what is the broad position of the movement and the ARF specifically? As you correctly mentioned, uh... On the 9th of November, the Prime Minister of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, signed this trilateral agreement with Azerbaijan and Russian Federation. We label that document as an absolute capitulation of Armenia to Azerbaijan. According to that document, Armenia left seven regions that were the security buffer zone to guarantee the security of the Nagorno-Karabakh of Artsakh and then to be a Trump during the uh, negotiations on Artsakh status. Besides, Azerbaijan stood at the positions they captured during the war. This includes the town of Shushi that controls the central Artsakh and also the southern parts of Artsakh. So effectively, Artsakh was split in two. So during the, its history, there were times that Artsakh was under foreign dominance, but Artsakh as such was a, uh, was a uni- united region. Now, the tragedy is that Artsakh was split, plus Armenia left regions without firing a single bullet, like Karvajar and Kashatar that were securing secure connection between Armenia and the Republic of Artsakh. And this capitulation was signed after 44 days of lies about the course of war. You may remember, or your audience may remember, the Iraqi war, when the, the Iraqi's Minister of Information was later called Comical Ali, was deceiving its population about the course of the war. We had such people in, Arme- in Yerevan too. The spokesperson for the Ministry of Defense was lying during the whole 44 days, despite some remarks that the war is not, that doesn't go in a way that you guys are describing. Mm-hmm. So this document was a capitulation and we lost the, all that we had gained during the, the 30 years of Artsakh movement. We lost more than 5,000 people. How many prisoners of war we currently have, no one knows. Actually, I assume that the government knows, but they are hiding the number. They are hiding the number of the true number of casualties and the number of injured people and people who went missing. This was a complete betrayal of Armenian national interests, and we lost a war because complete incompetence of the political government. Because armies that lose the wars, but the gov- but the countries that lose the wars, the governments that lose the wars, and it was complete incompetence by the Armenian political government. Besides that. We think that Armenia has provoked this war by its little ad- adventurous war in, in Davush in July of this year, when they captured one of the positions and basically demonstrated uh, to the war that Armenia is ready for military solution of the problem. So they sparked the war, and we, and we lost it. And Nikol Pashinyan, who had told several times that there won't be any secret deal, any behind-the-screen deal, and the population and the constituency will know what the government is negotiating about, lied to the people, and he signed this document. And we, we say that this is absolutely unacceptable. The government that has lost the war, during which we lost 
about 10,000 square kilometers, we uh, effectively lost control over the majority of Artsakh and we lost the lives of 5,000 people, cannot continue running the country. The only case in the world when a lost president or the lost leader of the country continued to run its country was Saddam Hussein. He lost the war, but he stayed as a president and you know how it ended, how everything ended. And also maybe Lenin, okay, he lost the First World War, but he stayed as a leader of the country. Actually, he, he did that deliberately, but that's not the story. So the government that has lost the war doesn't have the moral right to lead the country. Plus, he was in the office for the last two and a half years, and we cannot say and we cannot prove that were any significant or any advancement in the country, political successes, economic successes, just vice versa. He was dividing to conquer, okay, divided the nation into formers and the presence, into blacks and whites, into revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries. The internal situation in the country is horrendous right now, okay. These dividing lines divided the population, okay, brother against brother, wife against wives against husbands, fathers against sons, awful. So he suffered terrible losses from Azeris. The country is politically isolated, and internal uh, tensions can yield to a very bad consequences. Okay. All this means that he has to go. Okay. He lost the war, he screwed the economy, he caused internal tensions, and this man doesn't have the right to continue to run the country. Plus, there are also some accusations. There are many, many questions about how he lost the war okay. regarding the draft, how he mobilized the reservists, why he stopped mobilization and called for uh, for volunteers to go and to fight? You know, it's 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 stupid. Okay, you cannot demand so, you, you know you cannot stop mobilization but rely on on uh, on volunteers. Volunteers right. cannot fight against but commandos from Azerbaijan and from Turkey. So I understand that definitely you're seeking his resignation, but is there a particular way that you want this to be done and? Are there any other demands besides his resignation that the opposition movement uh, seeks and ARF specifically as well? The only way is the constitutional way. Okay, so we, we, we are not we don't do anything that goes against the law and the constitution. The constitution allows the public, the population, to, to demand the resignation of the incompetent government, and all our protests are peaceful protests. And these peaceful, peaceful protests were countered by brutal police forces. The, the police has used brutal forces. And many people were summoned to the police, including myself and other members of the, of the party's leadership. Okay? But we say we will not violate the Constitution. They violate the Constitution, but we don't. So this basically is the uh, resignation of the Prime Minister. And then the appointment of the interim Prime Minister who will run the country for one year, and after one year, he will call for national elections and a permanent government will be established. And please note that this current parliament will be uh, electing the new prime minister. Okay. So political consultations involving all political forces to form a national unity government, to take the country out of these troubles that this person has led us to. Okay. You, you mentioned harassment by police and national security forces, and I remember that very well early on is that still taking place now or has no there was no martial law actually but uh, when when tens of thousands of people are marching on the streets i don't think that police can use forces because there's no force that will that you can put against tens of thousands of people plus the police is not happy with what they're told to do okay when you talk to policemen they basically say okay guys we understand our sympathies with you but please understand us and we see that, that that the police, especially during the recent marches, is, is very loyal. When there are hundred and few hundred people on the street, okay, maybe they, the riot police will use force. But now you do not see like riot police with, uh, with buttons and with shields. Arthur, in the early days of the protests, we heard that many of the organizing leaders were being detained by the police and the National Security Service. Right. Can you say today that police intimidation is still taking place or uh, is there anything like that that's affecting the leadership of the protests? No, no, no. For the last few days, no, we don't see any political intimidation. We don't see any, any brutal police actions. But we don't know what's going on behind the screens. Like yesterday, one of the Armenian singers, who is just a singer, okay? She was a member of the parliament from Republican Party during the last parliament, but she was summoned to the police. I'm That's talking about uh, Shushan Petrosian. Petrosian. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, like why? Okay, why? There are some rumors that there is a, that the police is not happy and the national security service is not happy. But uh, we don't know what's going on behind the screens. Okay, what I can see is that there's no riot police. There are no clashes between police and the peaceful protesters today. Even though we march on the streets and the streets are effectively blocked. And uh, Arthur, Nikol Pashinyan, I think it was yesterday, he criticized your movement as being an elitist uh, protest and not representative of the entire Armenian populace. How would you respond to that? This is funny, actually, because he used a wrong word, okay? He meant it says to be the protest by the elite, but he said it was an elitary protest. Okay? So this, was not, this is a protest by people who represent all layers of the society, okay? We see... Uh, scientists, we see uh, artists, we see businessmen, we see clergy, we see students, laborers, farmers, everyone are united against him, okay? Yeah, the majority of the people on the street are white collars, okay? Yeah, but so what? The white collars who basically are the cream of the nation, who have responsibility of the nation, who have credit for it, and they have contributed to the development of the nation, they are against him, who are for him who are with him okay he twice he tried to bring up people to the to the square to show that he has supporters too and you remember this fiasco okay one of the people who was in military camouflage and he said i was from i-14 karvajar which is in jebrail okay karvajar was in northwest of right. artsakh and jebrail was in southeast of artsakh okay they were just a two most distant points yes. in, in, in Artsakh, okay? And this person doesn't even know where is Kelbajar and where is uh, Jebrail. <laughs> Another of his supporters, okay, when I say supporters, put them in a parenthesis, okay, said that my uh, nephew is still in Hadrut, while Hadrut was occupied by Turks already. Okay, well, th those are, you know, things that I remember as well. We've heard some criticism that there hasn't been enough of a policy proposal by the opposition so we wanted to know how your party, the ARF, differentiates from the wider opposition goals. Besides the resignation of the government, what, what specific programs are you suggesting in the next six to 12 months, for instance? Because so we heard uh, Vazgen Manukyan in his speech, in one of his speeches, say that he expressed a position on foreign funding of Armenian NGOs, for instance, and he was against that, uh, essentially. Is that position also shared by ARF? And are there additional such points that you can bring to the table? Okay, so we are talking about the interim government government, the national unity government, and this national unity government basically has few major functions or few missions. One of them is to restore the negotiation process with Azeris and with the Russians. Because what we see right now, Azeris unilaterally changed the borders of the Republic of Armenia. Yes. See what's, what's happening in Sunik right now, okay? Azeris moved their forces close to Armenian borders and say that these were the borders between Armenia, Soviet Armenia and Soviet Azerbaijan, and they are using Google Map. Okay, so the private company is referred to to use the for, to, to to use the borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan. There was no one from Armenian side to come and to say no. Okay, no, let's sit down and talk about borders. But or why shall we talk about the borders? Because this trilateral agreement has no mentioning about borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Besides that, Azerbaijan when it declared its national independence in 1991, said that they are that legal successors of Azero Republic of 1918 to 1920. And the third point of this declaration says that all relations between former Soviet republics shall be regulated by agreements and contracts. So the borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan shall be regulated by a long process to demark and to delineate the borders, okay? The, the mentioning Soviet-Armenian borders and referring to Google Map is absolutely irrelevant, okay? There is no party to negotiate with Azerbaijan and to negotiate with the Russians. It's true, and, and there has been a lack of leadership from the Armenian side, even in the last few days when uh, there have been these uh, skirmishes around Hintarer and everything, the Russians made it clear that this is Armenia's responsibility to uh, have a demarcation of the border that it right 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 and and remember and remember the reaction of of the prime minister's press secretary okay when when she was asked what's happening in Hadrut in Hintarel and Khatzabert she said talk to the Russians it's their responsibility so for That's Armenian right. for for current government Arsakh is no more Armenia it was a burden for them and they just threw off their shoulders and this is horrendous okay 
And there was another second question to the Ministry of Defense uh, asking for clarification. They said, we have no idea. We are waiting for uh, answers from the Defense Army of Artsakh. So Ar- current Armenian government clearly distances itself from Artsakh problem. Right. That this is not correct. Okay, the, the interim government shall reverse this position. Okay, Armenia is still the guarantor of independence, security, and territorial integrity of Artsakh Republic. Plus, there are lots of other issues, okay, like the prisoners of war, the lost, and the dead. Okay, no one no, gives the, number, the correct numbers. No one. And, and we are sure that either the government is extremely incompetent and they know how many people went missing, or they are deliberately hiding this, this number from the population. Mm-hmm. Plus, the Armenia is currently under, under major international isolation. There was no single word from the world about the loss of the war. Right. Okay, no word of sympathy. And internally, the tensions are very, very high. Okay? This intranational hostility shall be stopped. But Pashinyan himself is fueling this conflict. During his live address, during this capitulation night, okay, he said, I'm calling for citizens' revenge. And he said the people from the trenches will return, the armed people from the trenches will return, and they will... I'm sorry for, excuse my friend, I will screw the protesters. This person, instead of uniting the nation, continues dividing the nation. Plus, the economic situation is really horrible. Okay? The inflation, the, the prices are, are going up every single day. Every single day, go to the supermarket, you will see the changes of the prices. I have a quick question there. There's a broad base of agreement between the alliance of the 16 plus or the 17 plus. Are there major points of difference among the alliance no. members? No, no, no. Please note, it's more than 16 parties, okay? Sure. The other parties have said that they, have jo- they, they, they are joining this movement. Plus, even the political forces who are not in this group, in parenthesis, okay, they again call for, the pro- for, the, for his resignation, including the, uh, the supporters of the first president, LTP, Levantar Petrosian, who was the uh, godfather of Nikol Pashinyan, who basically uh, yes, he called was for his resignation mentor as well. Right, right. Every, everyone. And also you see the, the president of the republic, current president of the republic, the previous former presidents of the republic, presidents of Artsakh Republic, two Catholicos, the, the scientists, the artists, everyone. So this is not a political movement. This is a broad public movement who called for his resignation and the restoration of the sovereignty of the nation because all the public bo- public governance agencies are in they, they don't function try to send a letter to a ministry of uh, i don't know social protection the the, yeah. the government agencies are uh, not functioning yeah uh, arthur we, we heard from the government camp that they also see the need for extraordinary elections but they proposed uh, an, an alternative which is to have snap elections and what we also heard is that they are planning on changing the electoral code before they do that. What is your opinion of that proposal? Look, the, the government who has lost the war does not have the moral right to continue. There should be elections, but the elections shall not be administered by the current, current government. We don't trust them anymore. In t- 2018, when the first government was formed, there was a mentioning in the government program that the new elections will be called within one year. Nikol Pashinyan never disclosed when exactly during one year. He was the only person to know the dates of the elections. No one else knew about the date. This means that he badly abused his power, kept everyone in dark, and he was the only one who knew the dates. He had advantage over other political parties. Are we sure that he will not use this advantage once again? In 2018, right. he didn't have any reason to sex up the elections, but now he has. And remember, he was always criticizing the head of the electoral committee, mm-hmm. but the head of the electoral committee is still in office. There is no trust that he will not mess the elections. Arthur, I was going to ask, the alliance has settled on Vaskin Manugian as the interim prime minister to head a provisional government and lead the preterm elections. As the politics evolved right. in Yerevan, if the situation requires that a different potential candidate be nominated, is the ARF open to support that? Uh, what are the red lines for the Dashnak Sutun about who might or who might not be acceptable as an interim prime minister? We named the interim prime minister and we are supporting him. What's going to happen in, in the future, we don't know. 
Right. Okay, but unless there is a force majeure and everything change radically, we are happy with this candidate. This candidate was at the dawn of uh, Artsakh movement back in 1988. He was one of the founding fathers of the Republic of Armenia. And he was appointed as Minister of Defense in 1992 when Azeris had occupied more than 40% of uh, Artsakh and there were a few kilometers away from uh, its capital, Stepanakert, and he changed the course of the war and he won the war. In 1996, he was a united candidate from the opposition in the presidential elections. He won the elections, but the first, pro first president again messed the results, okay, and he was announced the winner. LTP was announced as the winner, and Vazgen Manukian had responsibility to step uh, to say, I am discontinuing my struggle because there is a risk that people can suffer. He is he's a responsible and professional person. And if you compare Vazgen Manukian with Nikol Pashinyan, look the education, look the professional experience, uh, look the moral qualities. Okay, that's why we uh, stopped on Vazgen Manukian. Plus, Vazgen Manukian said that this is, will be his, his last contribution and he will not run for the office during the next elections. So he doesn't have any personal interest in messing with the election results. Nikol Pashinyan has. All right. Thanks. This, is a, this has been an interesting discussion so far, Arthur. And I have one last question before we go. So during the 2018 elections, ARF didn't receive sufficient votes to gain any seats in the parliament. Now, we'd like to know what is your party's plan for becoming a relevant political force represented in the parliament of Armenia after this provisional period? And what is your party's vision for Armenia for the next five to ten years? Yeah, you are right. We lost the elections in, in um, 2018. We didn't get enough votes to get into the parliament. But look at the general environment where, this political, uh, where the elections were held. Look, okay, this was a high euphoria period, and uh, Pashinyan has managed to gain the support of the majority of the population. But if you compare our votes that we got in 2018 with the, one, with the number of votes we got in 2017, we were the party that lost the least of its votes. If you compare to the other parties, they lost more. The situation now has completely changed because now we are the backbone of the opposition movement. We have a large number of supporters. And we are sure that during the next elections, we will have enough representation in the parliament and we can even form the government, maybe uh, with our allies. Mm -hmm. And we have a very clear vision about the future of Armenia. We are the only party that two years ago published its fundamentals of the socio-economic policy of the, of the ARF party. We think that Armenia has, uh, in the, the, the economic policy has to be changed because Armenia is, Armenian governments were proponents of uh, extreme liberal Economic policies, policy, yeah. yeah, like the invisible hand will change anything. Where there's a proponent for small government and a laissez faire government, we say no, the government has to be very active. Economic development strategy shall be develop developed and shall be implemented, and the government shall not be just a passive regulator, but can be also, but can be an active participant in economic life. For instance, if uh, there are some vulnerable regions where no private investor will step in, the government shall do the first step, okay? If you start something, then the investors will come. Or if there is a profitable business, why shouldn't the government have stakes in that business, okay? Like in 2018, was the most profitable company in the world was a Saudi Arabian public company. And also, we on foreign relations, we have to be very, we have to have good relations with uh, superpowers, especially with the Russia. Contrary to what this government has done, because we lost all our friends and we didn't get any new friends. And uh, basically we say that we shall guarantee, we, we, we are left-wing party and we say, say that uh, the, the, the social justice is as equal as uh, economic development. So we are talking about fair distribution of national income. Because if you look at the statistic, the Gini coefficient, which shows the uh, polarization uh, of the population, okay, that the difference between the poor and the, and the rich is the, the difference is widening and widening. We say that this is a threat to national security and the policies shall be directed towards reducing the social inequality and economic inequality between different layers of the society. We are strong on Artsakh, our position is very strong and obviously we are, our position on Armenian genocide is very strong, okay. We have the rights that we are lost and we have to regain our rights. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your time, Arthur. This was a very interesting discussion. And the pleasure was mine, gentlemen.
I believe the next step in your uh, actions for the movement is uh, the uh, nationwide strike uh, on Tuesday. Is that correct? Right. True. Okay. Well, we'll be watching. Thanks again and talk to you next time. Talk okay. Soon. Have a nice day, guys. That concludes this conversation on Grung. We hope it was helpful in your understanding of some of the issues involved. We look forward to your feedback, including your suggestions for conversation topics in the future. Contact us on our website at grung.org or on our Facebook page, ann-grung, or in our Facebook group, grung-Armenian News Network. Special thanks to Laura Osborne for providing the music for our podcast. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.